So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here on Asteroid Day in this virtual meeting. And I would like to hopefully give you in the next 20 minutes a brief uh, overview our, of our model of how our own solar system formed to try to better understand and rather ask, uh, answer the very basic question of why do we even have an asteroid belt in our planetary system? So let's journey back around 4.6 billion years ago to try to answer that question. Now, obviously, no one was there to witness the birth of our sun and the formation of the solar system. But what we can do is build a scientific theory or a model of how um, our solar system formed based on its current architecture, based on the current observations that we've done, and, uh, and the scientific facts that we know about our own solar system. Now, just like any other scientific theory, uh, our theory would need to stand the test of time and potentially should be able to predict future observations as well. If new observations, however, were to come to light that are not predicted by a scientific theory in general, uh, we would need uh, to revise it uh, or make some modifications. And that applies as well to uh, our current theory of solar system formation. And the reason why I bring this up is that during the past few years, uh, there has been a discovery of thousands of exoplanets other planets that uh, are orbiting other planetary, other, other star systems. And they have an architecture that is somewhat different than our, our current, uh, so, than our solar system. So uh, a lot of researchers uh, have been looking at refining or updating our current theory of solar system formation to explain not just how our own solar system formed, but how can we form as well these other planetary systems. But for the purposes of this talk, we will focus on the uh, current aspects of the theory that explain how our own solar system formed. So what are the main characteristics of our own solar system that we would need our scientific theory to explain? So first of all is the current configuration of our own solar system. And if, you'll, if, you, see it, if you see this diagram, you will note that the major planets are, are uh, sort of grouped into two main groups. We have the inner planets closer to the sun, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And these are predominantly made up of rocks and metals. And then we have a second, a second group, an outer group of gas and ice giants. And these are larger in size, albeit less dense. And they're also uh, not just composed of rocks and metals, but they also have volatiles. And in the case of Jupiter and Saturn, they also have uh, a considerable inventory of light volatiles such as hydrogen and helium. Apart from the uh, grouping of the planets, we also have two main concentrations of small bodies orbiting the sun in our solar system. These are the asteroid belt, which is the main focus of our talk, which lies between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And if we were to look further to the right, Beyond the orbit of Neptune is another belt of small bodies called the Kuiper belt. And a current theory we need to explain why we actually have these two belts of small bodies in our system. If we were to look at our own solar system as well, sort of sideways, we will note an, another aspect as well of our solar system, and that is the planets and most of the bodies are orbiting the sun in sort of an equatorial plane. Everything is sort of lying in a disk orbiting the sun, more or less. If we were to look at that disk from above, if we were able to do this, we will also notice that uh, the planets and most of the bodies of the solar system are orbiting the sun in a counterclockwise if we're looking at it from above. So we need to, to explain as well why we have everything sort of in a disk shape around the sun and why is it orbiting around the sun the way it does. So our current theory of solar system formation is based on the nebular hypothesis, which was first laid out actually, I think back in the 18th century. And the nebular hypothesis stipulates that our, that our sun and, our, and the planetary system developed from a gravitationally collapsing nebula. Now nebulas, like the ones that you're seeing here on this slide, uh, are abundant in the, in, the, in the universe. They're interstellar, uh, clouds of cosmic dust and gas, and there's, uh, these are what uh, a lot of these are what astronomers would refer to as star nurseries, because these are the areas where 
stars are born and eventually a lot of these stars would have their own planetary systems. Now, in order for these nebulae to stop producing stars, you need to have a gravitational collapse. You need to have sort of a trigger where gravity would start to act and attract bodies next to, close to each other, allowing these things to grow up, create stars, and, uh, and, other, uh, and other components of a planetary system, particularly planets. So what is that trigger? It could be the interaction of two clouds, for instance, that starts to push material close to each other. It could be the explosion of a nearby supernova, um, a star, exploding star, a supernova. And the gravitational waves uh, resulting from that explosion would uh, maybe push things towards each other and trigger uh, the whole process to start collapsing a nebula. But regardless of the trigger, let's assume that this happens. So we start to, we initiate gravitational collapse in a nebula. And as a result, it starts to contract as materials are gravitating towards each other. And when this happens, three main effects will take place as the nebula contracts. And the first thing is you're going to get more collisions. So materials, because they're gravitating towards each other and, and it's contracting, there's less space between individual grains uh, and, and pieces, and you start to get a lot more collisions. As you get more collisions, you're going to get higher temperatures. And as a result, the early nebula will have very high temperatures, particularly though towards the center, as you're concentrating more mass towards the center, you have also more collisions there. So you get this temperature gradient where the center of the nebula is extremely hot, and as you move further away, it becomes uh, relatively colder and colder. So that temperature gradient is very important to us in, 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 in the framework of explaining why we have uh, uh, rocky planets in the center, towards the center, and the ga gas and ice shines towards the outside of the nebula. And this is something we'll go further into in a few slides, hopefully. Now, the third part, a uh, third effect that's going to take place uh, in a contracting nebula as you're getting more collisions and you get that temperature gradient as the mass is being concentrated towards the center just like a skate dancer moving their uh, their uh, their their arms uh, close to their body in order to spin faster due to the principle of conservation of momentum as you're concentrating the material towards the center if your nebula is starting, had actually already a small rotational component, it will start to spin faster and faster as you're concentrating the mass towards the center. And as the spin increases, you will get also tidal, uh, tidal forces and your sort of spherical nebula would flatten out into a disk shape or what we call a protoplanetary disk. And now that already gives us good indications of why most of the bodies are actually lying in sort of an equatorial plane around the sun. It's because that nebula has already uh, morphed into a protoplanetary disk. And what we have here is a diagram, a video simulation of how that happens, where you have a gravitationally collapsing nebula sort of morphing into a protoplanetary disk. Uh, notice the spin, no, sorry, note the, the rotation of the nebula. Uh, in that particular case, counterclockwise, similar to our own solar system. Notice at some point already the star has been born in the center where the temperatures are highest and where you've collected enough mass for thermonuclear reactions to take place and for a star to be born. The other parts, outer parts of the nebula are less dense, but eventually even there, materials gravitate towards each other, for first forming 10 kilometer size, kilometer size planetesimals that further grow into protoplanets and eventually grow into planets. And if you've noticed in this uh, video simulation, you'll see that the planets simply inherited the rotational direction of the nebula itself. And that's why most of the bodies in the solar system are orbiting in counterclockwise. Basically, they've inherited the uh, rotational direction of the nebula uh, from which they formed. Now, if we were to look, go back to that temperature gradient, because that will tell us something about the uh, grouping of our planets. Again, reminder, the highest temperatures are in the middle, and this is where the star is born. But as you move further away, as the temperature drops, uh, you will get uh, sort of sta different stability regions. So the nebula is starting off as very hot, it's in a gaseous state. But as you move further away, the temperature is dropping. And then generally with time, the whole nebula is understandably cooling down. So 
the first uh, things that are going to condense are the rocks and metals. And uh, they are going to condense sort of everywhere once it hits a certain temperature. Now in the inner part of the nebula, where it's quite hot, the first things that condense are the rocks and metals. But during that time, the volatiles are, uh, cannot condense because it's still too hot for them to do so. And as a result of this, the first thing that condenses are the rocks and metals. Now at the same time, this, the sun, we think the early sun was uh, extremely active and uh, more active than it is today. And it emitted very strong stellar winds that we think pushed the, uh, the lighter volatiles away from the inner part of the solar system. And that's the reason why we think the inner part of the solar system only contains rock and, and, and metal rich planets. And because these constitute a very small component of the nebula overall, in fact, the composition of the nebula, metals and rocks maybe constitute less, far less than 1%, uh, these bodies were never allowed to grow uh, into a very large size. However, and uh, if we were to look to the outer, outer parts of the nebula, uh, when it was cold enough, we had already, of course, the rocks and, and metals had condensed, but we also had an inventory of volatiles that could also condense. And as a result, these bodies were able to grow larger in size. And in fact, once they grew to a size large enough, they were able to gravitationally hold on to even the very light volatiles such as hydrogen and helium, which allowed them to further grow in size by incorporating hydrogen and helium from the, uh, from the nebula. And that is particularly the case with Jupiter and Saturn. So that's why these, uh, these outer planets were able to grow so much in size relevant in, 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 in uh, relative to the inner planets, it's because they contain volatiles and because they became large enough to trap the hydrogen and helium, something the inner planets could never do uh, due to their size and due to the activity of the early sun pushing a lot of these uh, lighter elements away from the inner part of the nebula. Now, all this is really nice. Do we have observational evidence from this? So. Basically, first, the, our theory was built on the observations and facts that we know about our own solar system. But as I said, a theory would need to stand the test of time when there are new observations. And in fact, uh, advancements in Earth-based and space telescope and, and, and space observations have allowed us now to observe in detail other nebulae and other, and other planetary systems being formed. And as, and as you can see in this image here from one of the nebulas, you can actually see as we zoom in into different parts, evidence for stars being born and uh, the surrounding material around them that could uh, eventually create solar systems and planetary systems around these stars. So we are starting to have these, this observational evidence uh, showing us this process in, mo uh, in reality. Now, this is even a, a much better observational evidence where we have uh, an image uh, taken by uh, an Earth-based telescope, I believe, uh, superimposed over a, a Hubble Space Telescope image where you can clearly see a protoplanetary disk. So this is a system that has already, this is a nebula that has already gravitationally collapsed, created a protoplanetary disk, and uh, is a, and you can we, you can see towards the center that there's uh, there's probably already a star born in the middle, and if you notice you'll see there are rings and gaps within that disk, and these are the areas where we think planets are being formed in these areas, and the reason for why you have these gaps is they're already starting to clear the neighborhood around them as they're orbiting their the inner parts, uh, as they're crawling as they're orbiting their their star, they're accreting materials. And, and as a result of this, you're getting the gaps in the flattened nebula or the protoplanetary disk. So this is, again, a very nice image of a, pla a planetary system in the process of forming, a very nice observational evidence that seems to uh, be consistent with our theory of how our own solar system formed. So now we have a sort of a better understanding of how our own solar system came to have these groupings of planets. Let's now switch our focus into these small bodies. So we have the asteroid belt and Kuiper belt. Why do we have these belts? And what are these small bodies? So generally speaking, 
the, all the small bodies are leftovers from the formation process of the solar system. These are planetesimals uh, that were never able to get to grow into planets. They were never incorporated into planets for various reasons. And here you can see actually image uh, uh, a, a number of such small bodies, not just asteroids, that have been visited by spacecraft. So on the left is a bunch of asteroids, but you can also see Comet 67P, Shurimov Gerasimenko. You also have Arakoth, which is a Kuiper Belt object located in the Kuiper Belt. Um, but let's focus now on the asteroids, and I'm going to use uh, 21 Lutetia as sort of a, an example of such an asteroid. This asteroid was the target of a flyby of the Rosetta spacecraft on its way to Comet 67P. If you look at this, the, that asteroid uh, showcases sort of the basic uh, attributes of an asteroid. It's, it's small, irregular in shape. It has a lot of impact craters on it, which means it's quite old. And in fact, it's, sorry, it's as old as the solar system itself. And these asteroids are mainly composed of rocks and metals, uh, but can also contain carbon rich compounds and some ice. So for, uh, in that respect, we consider asteroids as the building blocks of the inner planets, the rock and metal planets. So if you want to study, get a better understanding of how these planets formed, what are the conditions, we look at asteroids. And as it happens, asteroids are also the main source of meteorites that fall on Earth. So we actually have a lot of these asteroids on Earth, for chunks of them that we can study in detail. Now, most of the asteroids are situated in the asteroid belt, but many of them reside closer to Earth, and some of them we even call near-Earth near asteroids. So the, re the, the question here is, and these are some sort of some examples of these near-Earth asteroids uh, that have been actually visited by spacecraft. And in, in fact, the one that you see on the right, Bennu, uh, is an asteroid that is currently uh, uh, the target of an on ongoing NASA mission called OSIRIS-REx that is planning to collect a sample from this near-Earth asteroid and return it to Earth. And in fact, Ryugo, that you see there as well, is uh, a similarly near-Earth asteroid that was visited by a Japanese mission called Hayabusa 2, which also collected samples uh, from this asteroid and is bringing them uh, back to Earth. So how did they get here? And this is a question of relevance because it would tell us a lot about the asteroid belt itself and the processes that act on it. So these near asteroids are close to the sun because of a process called resonance. So if we were to look at the distribution of asteroids in the asteroid belt, which you can see in the plot on the right, you'll see there are actually certain gaps at certain distances from the sun. And these gaps are what we call gravitational resonances with Jupiter. So for instance, the three to one there is an area of the, of the belt where bodies, if, you, if they were in this location, they would orbit the sun three times when Jupiter orbits the sun one time. And these sort of ratios of orbits with a larger body, uh, in that particular case, Jupiter, create either stable orbits or they create unstable orbits where bodies could not actually lie in these locations for uh, a significant amount of time because they would, be the, uh, they would be affected by gravitational forces from that larger body, in that case, Jupiter. So what is Jupiter doing here is that it's, you, you can clearly see it has a gravitational influence on the asteroid belt. And it's actually the main reason why bodies in the asteroid belt were never able to form a planet in its own right because of that gravitational influence of Jupiter. Furthermore, these resonance orbits allow, uh, lead to, uh, if you have any sort of migration due to collisions, and this is something that happens a lot during the, in the, in the, that happens in the asteroid belt, then anything that starts to fall into these sort of resonance orbits with Jupiter will get kicked out eventually from the asteroid belt by the influence of Jupiter. Uh, some of it might get kicked out of the solar system entirely. Some of it might get at, uh, maybe attracted uh, to Jupiter. And, and some of it is actually pushed towards the inner part of our own solar system. And that's how the near-Earth asteroids came to be close to Earth due to the gravitational influence of Jupiter. So resonance is, in fact, one of the main reasons for no planet forming in the asteroid belt. So thanks to Jupiter, all these bodies situated in the asteroid belt never had the chance to form a planet like the, uh, uh, like the inner planets. Uh, 
And the same, re and the same thing, the resonance, is partly the reason why we actually have no planet in the Kuiper Belt region. That's why we also have a Kuiper Belt towards the outside. In that particular case, Neptune is playing the role that Jupiter is playing in the inner part of the solar system, but even less so, but particularly less so because Neptune is less massive than Jupiter. However, in the case of the Kuiper Belt, it's not just Neptune that is, uh, is sort of preventing uh, these bodies from accreting into a large body, but as you're moving, as you're so far away in the nebula, as well in terms of density of materials it's much lower than the inside of the uh, of the it's much uh, it's much denser than the inner part of, of of the nebula during its formation and as a result this area is less dense less collisions which means there was less chances for materials to accrete together and form a planet so there are these two main reasons why the kuiper belt never uh, formed a large planet that we know of we might down the line maybe find a planet or something that would uh, that would uh, uh, force us to maybe revisit uh, this this aspect of the theory. But so far, this is our best understanding for why we actually do not have any large planet in the Kuiper Belt region. So I'm going to go very quickly to the Kuiper Belt because it has very nice comparisons with the asteroid belt and gives us a little bit more information as well about our own solar system in general. So the Kuiper Belt is this equatorial torus-shaped region. Beyond, the, uh, beyond planet Neptune, uh, around 30 to 55 astronomical units away. Now, we actually visited that area with a spacecraft recently. Uh, first of all, uh, there was a flyby by Pluto, which is considered a Kuiper Belt object by the New Horizons space mission, a NASA mission, back in 2015. And that the same spacecraft actually had a flyby of a small Kuiper Belt uh, in 1st of January, 2019, which we call Arakoth, which you can see here uh, in this uh, beautiful image on the right. And you can see from that image that these, this Kuiper Belt object uh, sort of binary, uh, which is very similar to a lot of comets. You will notice that it's extremely primordial. It's in fact as old as the asteroids, but you do not see a lot of impact craters on it. And, uh, and that's because of the very low density of the region as a whole, as we as as I spoke earlier. So that there, has, there hasn't been a lot of collisions compared to what's happening in the asteroid belt, which is, where it is relatively more crowded and you get more collisions. So in terms of looking at a primordial shape, uh, this is as close as you can get for how a planetesimal looked like 4.6 billion years ago. And if we were to look at the Kuiper belt objects, we would consider them as the building blocks of the gas and ice giants because these bodies are composed of rocks and metals, but also a significant uh, volatile component. So the Kuiper Belt objects are to the ice and gas giants what the asteroids are to the inner planets. So we've come to the conclusion of our talk. I'll leave the summary slide uh, for you to look at, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much for your attention.